afraid not. It'll be 12 weeks at the very least, Captain. And I doubt if I can get the right quality timber. You must, Mr. Trumper. Nothing else will suffice. And six weeks ought to be quite sufficient. I need more light for the main mess deck. An extra skylight there. Morning, Captain. More headroom, too. What would you say to raising the entire deck level by 12 inches? Oh, I don't think she'd take it, Captain. Ah, what with the extra weight of the cannon, she'd be top heavy. You get caught once, beam on on an heavy sea, she'd go right over. Nonsense, Mr. Trumper. The rattlesnake has already had her decks raised with no ill effects. So that, of course, was in Chatham. I'll see you in the poop cabin, Mr. Sullivan. I also intend to strengthen the cross trees. Now, as to the rigging. Can you give me a date for completion? Well, ready? Be clear. Two six. Ready? Well, sir. All that I'd hoped. The Beagle will complete her refitting, once I can persuade Mr. Trump to set his men to work, and then proceed once more to South America. Object of the voyage, to complete the survey of Patagonia, Tierra del Fuego, and then to chart the coasts of Chile and Peru, and to carry out a chain of chronological measurements around the world. Congratulations, sir. Lord Commissioners of the Admiralty confirm the reappointment of Robert Fitzroy as officer commanding His Majesty's surveying vessel, Beagle, at the 27th of June, 1831. Well, Father? I'm at a loss, Charles. I sent you to Cambridge with your future in the church clearly in mind, and now there comes this letter from a Professor Henslow recommending you for a post as a naturalist and on a ship. Well, he's a clergyman as well, Father. The vessel to be fitted out expressly for scientific purposes. A rare opportunity for a naturalist. Great misfortune if it should be lost. And how long do you suppose all this is expected to take? Three years. I know that sounds a long time. And who, may I ask, then, is to pay? Why does not this Professor Henslow go himself? I think he wanted to, but his wife's not been well. He certainly has better qualifications than I do. No doubt. And what worries me, Charles, that you're still unqualified for anything. You have abandoned medicine. Now you propose to abandon Cambridge, and even this, this fellow Henslow says you can hardly be regarded as a finished naturalist. You merely have some aptitude for collecting, observing, and noting. That hardly amounts to an education. Read his last sentence, Father. May I? Do not put on any modest fears or doubts about your disqualifications. For I assure you, I think you are the very man they are in search of. Conceive yourself to be tapped on the shoulder by your bum bailiff and affectionate friend, J.S. Henslow. No. The whole wild scheme is disreputable and out of the question. I'm sorry, Charles. No man of common sense could possibly advise you to apply. Suppose I could find one. Find what? A man of common sense. In my estimation? Of course. Then I should reconsider. There was only one man with my interests at heart who could possibly alter my father's opinion. My Uncle Joss. List your father's objections to me while we drive. I'll do my best. 
Perhaps my powers of persuasion will prove inadequate. I'm promising nothing. One, that it would be disreputable for a future clergyman. Two, there must be some serious objection to the expedition, or someone else would have been offered the post. Three, that I shall never settle down to a steady life afterwards. Four... Don't, don't, don't tell me any more, or I might begin to agree with him. And this man Fitzroy, do you know anything of him? Well, he's said to be an excellent young officer and well-connected. Grandson of the Duke of Grafton, nephew of the late Lord Castlereagh. Who committed suicide. Well, something we could hardly blame his nephew for. I suppose most of us are guilty of trying to relive our own lives through our children. I've seen it a dozen times in my own practice. Yes, but you're sensible enough to recognize the symptoms. I've certainly never had any desire to subject my person to the rigors of the ocean. <laughs> Indeed, I doubt if the Navy is a ship capable of undertaking such a task. Now, the fact is, there's something quite unusual about Charles. I'm very fond of him, of course. And between the two of us, he seems to have an eye for my girls. Though which one he prefers, I'm at a loss to know. But beyond all that, he strikes me as a young man of enlarged curiosity and considerable powers of thought. So considerable that without hesitation he brings me the one man who might be capable of making me change my mind. Shall we tell him? Why not? Charles? Father? I used to maintain he was one of the most sensible men in the world. I said you'd be deuced clever to spend more than your allowance on the Beagle. But then they all tell me you are very clever. I must confess, I was expecting a more experienced man. To be blunt with you, this other candidate, Mr. Chester, seems to have the better qualifications. But Henslow speaks well of you. He knows me very well. Allow me to read from my instructions from the hydrography department. Of this kind of half knowledge, we have had too much. The present state of the science seems to demand that whatever is now done should be finally done. And that coasts that are constantly visited by English vessels should no longer have the motley appearance of alternative error and accuracy. In other words, there will be no place on board the Beagle for time-wasting or dilettantism. Would you agree with that? Oh, wholeheartedly. Whatever burdens it may entail, I intend to carry out these instructions to the letter. I understand. They tell me your family is Whig, Mr. Darwin. And I understand yours is Tory, sir. Do not think that that might create problems for two men who have to share the same cabin for two or three years? You're a high Tory and I'm such a low Whig. I would almost disappear from view. I doubt it. Of course, I should be quite willing to share my cabin. I assure you I should be miserable if you were uncomfortable. However, I live very poorly whilst on board. No wine, and the plainest of dinners. That would be of no consequence to me, I assure you. <laughs> 